Good evening, my name is David Lindquist, engineering class of 86 and Fuqua class of 91. I'm the assistant vice president for regional engagement with the alumni and development group. And it's my privilege to welcome you to this evening's program called Policy, Politics and Promise, Biden's First Month. This program is one of the many offerings of our new Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute an interdisciplinary educational program designed for the Duke alumni community. The Forever Learning Institute showcases Duke's faculty and alumni experts through a combination of lectures, panel discussions, online courses, and workshops that currently are all being offered virtually. In addition to the live programs through the Duke alumni website, you can find curated playlists on our um, lifelong learning YouTube channel, Duke produced podcasts and articles written by members of the Duke community. Today's program is the first session in the America Today series, which investigates a range of topics that are making headlines in the United States. We have a great panel in store for you this evening, but before we get going, I'd like to note that we have a member of Duke's Chronicle staff here attending with us tonight, um, who is covering the event for an upcoming edition of the student newspaper. Welcome to the program, Parker. We're glad you're here with us tonight. I'm also sure that tonight's program will provoke a number of questions. Um, the last quarter of the program is reserved for uh, questions from the audience, from our alums. What I ask you to do is use the chat function in Zoom and direct your questions to me, David Lindquist. I'll curate those and uh, pose those to Paula and the panel as we get going. For our program this evening, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Paula McLean, who will serve as our moderator. Paula is the Dean of the Graduate School and Vice Provost for Graduate Education at Duke. She's also the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Professor of Public Policy. Her research focuses on racial minority groups, particularly inter-minority political and social competition and urban politics. In addition to numerous articles that she's published in top journals, she is co-author of Can We All Get Along? Racial, Racial and Ethnic Minorities in American Politics, which was published in 2017. Paula is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and most recently served as the president of the American Political Science Association. Paula, I'll turn the Zoom screen over to you to get us started and to welcome the rest of your panel. Thank you, David. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a panel. The panel description is, after an historic battle for the White House, Joe Biden became the 46th president of the United States on January 20th with unprecedented challenges to tackle in his first days in office. In this discussion, our panel will take a look at his first month as America's most senior head of state and commander in chief of the armed forces, the policies proposed, the challenges faced, and the opportunities on the horizon. I have three of my colleagues who are joining me tonight on the panel and let me introduce them to you. First is David Shazner. David is a professor of the practice of public policy uh, and the professor of the practice at the Sanford School of Public Policy and director of the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security at Duke University. And before coming to Duke in 2005, Shazner served as Minority Staff Director for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Homeland Security, Legislative Director for Senator Gene Carnahan, Special Counsel for the General Counsel of the Department of Defense, and Counsel to Senators Joe Biden Jr. and William S. Cohen. He previously served as a trial attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice and law clerk, law clerk to the Honorable Norma Shapiro, Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and law clerk in the Office of the Solicitor General of the United States. Joining David is my colleague and my incoming department chair, so I think I have to be nice to him. 
uh, Dr. Carrie Haney, who's an associate professor of political science, as I said, the incoming chair of the Department of Political Science. Uh, and he's also currently chair of academic council, which means he is the voice of the faculty uh, at Duke. Uh, Professor Haney's research and teaching interests are in race and ethnic politics and the intersection of race and gender, legislative processes, state level politics, Southern politics and, compared, and comparative urban politics. His all articles have been published widely and his most recent book is a 221 book um, published by Oxford University Press called Race, Gender and, and Political Representation toward a more intersectional approach. Thank you for joining us, Carrie. And finally, but definitely not least, we have Michelle Connolly. Michelle is professor of the practice in the economics department at Duke University. She was the economics director of Duke in New York, which was financial markets and institutions program from 2007 to 2009, and the director of the EcoTeach for several years. She served as one of two arts and sciences faculty, uh, faculty members of the Duke Alumni Association Board from 2012 to 2016. And Professor Connolly currently serves as the director of the honors program in economics. In 2011, Professor Connolly won the Howard D. Johnson Trinity College Teaching Prize and was named among the top 5% of Duke University undergraduate instructors in 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2017, way to make us all feel inadequate, Michelle. Her, work, <laughs> her work has been um, funded by the National Science Foundation, the Duke Arts and Sciences Research Council, the Spencer Grant, and the Teagle Grant. So we have a very um, stellar group of my colleagues here tonight. And so I'm going to start um, by just posing that it is impossible to talk about President Biden's first month in office without talking about what happened before his inauguration, especially the insurrection at the US Capitol on January 6, 2021. This event preceded by several months of the former president, Donald Trump, pushing the lie that he actually won the election and it was stolen from him, which set the stage for the events of January 6th. So my first question will focus on that event of January 6th. And I wanna lead off with um, uh, addressing the first question to Professor Shazner and others, please jump in after David responds. The first question is, I know that you worked on Capitol Hill on the Senate side for a number of years. And I am certain that you felt some of the anxiety that those who were pinned down in the various rooms on both the House and the Senate side felt as well as on the floors of both chambers. My first question is your reaction to these events. And the second part is, how do you think those events have made President Biden's task of governing more difficult? Will Republicans, many of whom voted not to certify the Electoral College votes, support any of Biden's initiatives, or will they continue the pattern of obstruction that we saw during the Obama administration? Well, thanks, Paula, and welcome to uh, all of our alumni. It's always a, a great pleasure to, to talk with you and answer your questions and interact. Uh, so yes, I actually worked on both the House and the Senate side. And, um, you know, it, it, it always felt like a very safe place to work. Um, and I think that is kind of, you know, forever uh, damaged. Uh, and, and that's a real tragedy because, you know, one of the hallmarks of our democracy is really its openness. Uh, you know, I always would joke, I, I worked for a number of different uh, members of Congress uh, and, but I'll just tell you about when I worked for Senator Biden, you know, sometimes he would come off the train in the morning and he was like, you know, I bumped into Sandra X or Jimmy John, you know, when I was at the grocery store and so on. And, you know, and they didn't have uh, massive uh, secret service around them. They, they were literally there at the grocery store. Uh, and that's a great thing. 
uh, that that's very healthy for our democracy that people uh, our, our representatives can mingle around the people and I think you know of course there was the Gabri, uh, uh, Gabby Giffords uh, assassination attempt I think that was kind of written off as a, a you know kind of a per, the perpetrator was a, was really mentally ill this was like a seen as a one-off you know kind of thing but I think what what we're seeing is uh, you know uh, this kind of level of anger public anger uh, at our political institutions uh, and the breaching of you know what was considered a very safe place I think by the members and the staff uh, for them to you know spend a lot of their time um, I think is going to lead to a call for you know more security for them both while they're in Washington and at home and uh, I think that's uh, you know it's very sad sometimes we make changes in our lives due to security threats and they, we never go down. We never provide, start providing less security. It's always more, more, more. And we lose a little something uh, every time uh, that happens. Now, as to your next question about um, governance, uh, you know, I think it's a mixed uh, thing for, for the president. Um, you know, Joe Biden started his campaign for the presidency by pointing out, you know, uh, Charlottesville and, and the riots there. And he, he made it his mission, his core message was uh, to kind of, uh, that this was a fight for the soul uh, of America. And I think to the extent that uh, January 6th made that even more poignant and uh, more central to the challenges uh, that we were facing, I'm not saying it made it easier for him, but I feel like it ratified him as the right person for the country at the right time. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's always good. I'm not saying it's making him more popular, but it just, I think it ratified the fact his, his election, but also that, uh, his, his demeanor, the way he wanted to lead the country, uh, uh, his, you know, I think he gave a lovely talk, uh, yesterday about marking, uh, the COVID deaths. And I think the country, you know, l large portion of the country, was really ready for that. And so I think um, January 6th highlighted the urgency of it. And now as far as, you know, uh, the politics and building coalitions on the Hill, uh, as you point out, even after the riot, uh, over uh, 100, 150 Republicans still voted not to certify uh, the election. So uh, there was never going to be that much of a outreach I think that what could have made a difference really is that if uh, Trump had been convicted on his impeachment and then uh, prevented from running for office again in some ways to kind of defang his political influence, you know, I think that would have liberated people to, uh, to, to, to operate with a little bit more elbow room, a little bit more looking at problem solving rather than kind of uh, having to play to the base. Uh, have, with that not having happened and Trump really getting ready to get back onto the uh, political battlefield, all indications are that he wants very much to do that. I think that will make it even more difficult uh, to, for, um, you know, to have kind of the normal, the kinds of give and take that leads to, you know, more legislation, more productivity in Congress. Uh, Carrie, let me let me bring you into this discussion with another question. Uh, unless any of the panelists want to add to David's comments on the first question, I can move to Carrie. Okay, okay. Carrie, do you think that the Biden Justice Department under Attorney General designate Merrick Garland will prosecute as many of the insurrectionists as possible. There are concerns that some of the folks will quote unquote walk with a slap on the wrist. We've already seen kind of racial disparities in the insurrection and in how the insurrectionists uh, are being handled uh, by the courts. One black male insurrectionist, as far as I know, is still being held without, held without bond while a white female insurrectionist from, from Texas was allowed to go on a work-related trip to Mexico. 
Yeah, it's a good question. First, let me uh, welcome the alums home, so to speak. Uh, happy to be here with you. Always happy uh, to uh, speak with you and meet with you. And hopefully soon we'll be able to do it uh, in person. Uh, Paul, it's a good question. I mean, I think there have been some racial differences uh, before, during, and we have to wait and see about how much after the insurrection. If you think about your, before the insurrection itself, at the rally that was held uh, near the White House, uh, the horse posture of the police and others was much different than what you would see had that crowd been uh, a different crowd, uh, that large of a crowd assembling in the capital uh, city. Uh, would have drawn a, a larger presence of uh, police force before the insurrection. Uh, when we get to the point of the insurrection, uh, and I was home watching the news and uh, watching this unfold before my very eyes, and was surprised that there were not shots fired. Given how violent what we were all watching, uh, the, the, the violence that took place that there was not shots fired. And I thought, had those been folks of a different color, uh, we'd been talking about a different set of circumstances, I think. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens now after the insurrection. Uh, Judge Garland, uh, in his uh, testimony today, in his uh, confirmation hearing, uh, and, and yesterday and today, he's vowed to prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. One question is, what does that mean, the extent of the law? It's not clear uh, how much of the law can be brought to bear. Because in some cases, we don't have crimes for some of the events that may have taken place uh, that day in the Capitol. But my guess is yes, that there will be prosecutions. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if there are racial disparities in that. I think this administration will work hard to make that not happen and not be the case. But I do think they will, uh, they'll be forced to, to prosecute the full extent of, of the law. I'll, I'll just add a little bit of data to that. Uh, so to my knowledge, there have been 237 federal prosecutions uh, filed, uh, and and uh, there have been additional filed by the uh, District of Columbia for maybe lesser charges relating to things like trespassing and, and so on. Uh, so that's a, that's a lot of charges, and some of them are for quite, quite serious offenses. There's some conspiracy cases that have been filed uh, against some of the members of groups like Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers trying to, uh, which are, you know, much talking about planning and forethought and things of that nature. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm optimistic. There was a, a case today filed against uh, somebody who was essentially trying to beat a police officer uh, with a flag pole, a pole and, and he was held uh, without, without bond and he's facing uh, up to 20 years or more uh, in jail. So, I don't know about that case that you mentioned, and that seems worth looking into, but I think the indications are so far that the FBI and the Justice Department are using, you know, a large number of the tools at their disposal to uh, hold the people accountable uh, for what they did that day. So I'm optimistic. Good. Let me kind of shift gears a little bit, and I want to Paula, go to- Paula, yeah, that might be yeah. more Absolutely. Talk about something that David said earlier, you know, about the, the attack on, on the on the Capitol. And again, and, and I want to say this and distinguish two things that in both are very serious, the attack on the building itself, and, a, and it was also an attack on what was happening in the building, yeah. right? Uh, so you had the, the violation of the Capitol in the physical space, but it was an attack on the democratic system, my democratic system of governance, and that's serious, and I don't know uh, you mentioned about governing in this context. I mean, part of what this administration would have to do is somehow restore uh, American institutions. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that the leadership of the, of the Congress uh, decided to come back that evening and to carry on with the business. Uh, but we have quite a bit of work to do where uh, people have questions about our institutions. And our institutions are only as strong as the folks who serve in them. Uh, and they have questions about the court now and whether the court's been political and the decision about taxes and whatnot. So we have quite a bit of work to do to rebuild the institution. We can repair the walls of that building and the doors mm -hmm. and the glass that were broken. We have a lot more repair to do that's going to be harder work for all of us. Carrie, I think that is an excellent point. I mean, you know, after um, January 6th, and many of us were talking to, um, uh, to reporters and the first thing I thought about was Shay's Rebellion. Hmm. Remember when they surrounded the courthouse and kept you know, the judges from meeting because they were in debt 
And then I thought of Wilmington in 1898 and, you know, a successful coup of the elected officials and installing an insurrectionist government, you know, in Wilmington. And it was, you know, um, everybody was kind of talking about the War of 1812 and the Capitol being burned, but it was more, as you say, trying to stop the democratic process, you know, in ways that we had never, had never seen before. Michelle, I'm going to, to um, kind of shift gears just a little bit, but I wanna give this question to you. President Biden's proposed COVID-19 relief package of $1.9 trillion appears to have no support from Republicans. And it appears that the package is gonna be pushed through using the reconciliation process rather than legislation. Just reminding everybody that reconciliation is essentially a way for Congress to enact legislation on taxes, spending, and the debt limit with only a majority, 51 votes, or 50 in this case, if the vice president, Kamala Harris breaks the tie in the Senate. And it avoids a threat of the filibuster, which requires 60 votes to overcome. So because Democrats have 50 seats, plus a Democratic vice president, reconciliation is the way to get the tax and spending bill to President Biden's desk, even if all 50 Republicans oppose it. So Michelle, do you think this is a good idea for Biden and the Democrats to use this approach? Well, here I'm going a little bit outside of my normal field as an economist, um, but one thing that does seem obvious is uh, we've had a, a particularly difficult last four years in terms of partisanship. And uh, I remember McCain arguing uh, strongly that we needed to do things in a bar bipartisan way. And I think that nowadays we want to think very carefully about trying to change the current way in which decisions are made in Washington. So while reconciliation the using re reconciliation is certainly a way to go through, it might not be setting the ideal precedent. Um, and specifically here, uh, when you say, you know, no Republican support, um, I know a few months ago, we were hearing positive Republican support. So part of what seems to be happening is that what's being put in is changing over time, is changing as um, uh, consideration for the reconciliation method is going up. And so that in of itself makes me think, if there's a way for, for Biden to do this in a more bipartisan way, we, it would probably be better for the economy, better for the country, better for our democracy, um, and would force some discussions of certain items that um, have amplified, like the amounts that were originally listed for stimulus have grown since they originally specified. So I think the problem with any situation where one um, party is dominating and using rules to really push through what they want quickly, which is I completely understand in the current setting, um, may not be the right way to choose the optimal policies. Okay. David, Kerry. Yeah, let me let me jump in and say I, I would agree with Michelle if it were different circumstances. I think, you know, given where we are with the pandemic and the economy that's been uh, wrecked by the pandemic, uh, I think it's in Biden's interest to pass legislation however he can pass it. And if it turns out to be a good thing, right, when folks can get on their feet, you can save some businesses, get the economy going again. Uh, I think he will, and the party and the country would be better off for that. Another part of the problem is I think he has is, I, I agree with Michelle that it's best to do these things, particularly big packages like this on 1.9 trillion. I mean, that's quite a bit and that has implications much into the future. It'd be best to have uh, a lawyer opposition as part of the debate. But the Republicans in disarray. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't know who you deal with on that side. They're having a, what appears to be the makings of a civil war 
in that party. And so who do you negotiate? How do you negotiate with a party that's in disarray? Right, but I would counter that there's a difference between wanting to get something through quickly and knowing that what you're getting through is the right thing. And I think that's the problem. If it's only based on one perspective, uh, then it may not be the optimal thing to get through. And let, let me just give explain why I'm saying this. And I'm saying this as an economist, not as a someone, an observe, a political observer. But the CARES Act passed under the Trump administration was already over $2 trillion. This new one is, is being listed at about 1.9 trillion. US government debt is now at about 127% of GDP. We've never had that high a rate of government debt since uh, World War II, when we hit about 100. And since, uh, since World War II, we've always been around uh, between 30 to 65%. So the fact that we are hitting almost 130% of GDP, like our government debt is almost 130% of GDP, and our federal deficit is just about hitting 15%, which again, is the highest it's ever been since World War II, suggests that, or as an economist, I would say one needs to be careful about how far we want to push this, how quickly and how much, especially if we think that the economy, or I hope, I pray, <laughs> that the economy will start to stabilize and improve with vaccinations and things like that, then we wanna be careful that the, uh, the current COVID relief is really intended to be relief that allows households to smooth things over time until things improve versus just ramming a, another huge spending on top of the CARES Act to the point where we're really spending far more than the economy can really support in the long run and that we lead with that leads us to long long run consequences because we want to do too much too quickly right at the time that hopefully we're getting into a slightly better period so i agree with you like better to get something done than nothing but if there isn't the full discussion do we know that that something is the right thing to do we'll make a I couple points here. Oh. I, i'd like to ask michelle i'll give michelle the challenge that president biden gave to the republicans when he said okay so what is it that's in the law that you think uh should be taken out is it the aid to the cities and states that have had this huge a blow put to their budgets and they're going to have to lay off teachers and firefighters and police? Is it the aid to uh, the, the families, the checks? Um, uh, well, is it the unemployment okay. insurance? I mean, those are the three biggest ticket items in the whole thing. I'm not an economist and I also don't know all the things that are in the CARE Act, but there's a lot of money in there for uh, public health to uh, help with the vaccine distribution. So what are the things that you think that are in there that shouldn't be uh, in there because I don't think I would rely on the kind of partisanship of the Republicans to kind of enlighten the debate. Because if you go back to the, if you go back to the Obamacare, uh, there was a, you know, a, a 10 to 12 month uh, negotiation with the Republicans to try to you know, improve the bill, get their ideas and so on. And that went on and on and on. And then they, they all still voted against it anyway. And which is exactly what I think would happen here. David, yeah. and you just did my follow-up question <laughs> Sorry. You know, to Michelle. And that was, what are the economic prospects for the U.S. economy? And is the $1.9 trillion relief package necessary, right? Will those that really need the assistance receive it through the package? I know economists are on, you know, I heard an interview with Paul Krugman today, you know, who thinks the package needs to be big, but if he had to take anything out, it would be the thing that everybody wants. And that's the $1,400, you know, um, um, payment, which he says now, I mean, you can't take that out, right? Because everybody wants that, but that's what I would take out. So Michelle? Well, so you've actually asked two different questions. So I, I'll try and hit both. So I, David, I completely agree that it's not clear that you're, you're 
necessarily going to get the best uh, uh, discussion coming from from certain groups, or, nor is that a guarantee that they they will vote for it. But there, a relief package should be a relief package, not a fundamental change in in longer term programs. And so, so if you asked me, and I'd have to go into this a little bit more deeply. Uh, but I would focus on, you know, what is, what is something there to help people who have short term, hopefully short term needs and, uh, you know, are certainly liquidity constrained, need this help, need to make it through. I think we do also want to think long term about how do we insulate our economy and our population more from these kinds of shocks? How do we create less inequality in terms of how people are hit by things? All of those things are very important. But when you think about under the CARES Act, right, how much money they had spent on the PPP and most of it went to the largest, wealthiest companies because the rules are heavily influenced by the lobbyists. And so fundamentally, there's this idea, oh, we need to help this, but then who does it go to? It doesn't necessarily go. Those where... are the loans to the small businesses, you mean? Right, yeah, exactly. Right. It's not so, and, and I mean, but that's... Well, it was called the Pay Protection Program. Oh, yeah. employee, okay, but not yeah. the personal protective uh, gear. No, yeah. sorry. No, no, exactly. Um, so, and I'm using that example to show that I'm not picking on one relief package versus another, but even in the current well, one. That's the only like... part of the bill the Republicans actually like. Oh yeah, no, that's, I'm not arguing for the Republicans or the Democrats. I'm yeah. telling you as an economist, the, a lot of these relief packages are filled with things that have nothing to do, or not nothing, are, are, are perhaps intended for one thing, but actually end up doing another. And I'm just looking at uh, the current one, you know, they have 3 billion for the aerospace manufacturing industry. Now, certainly Boeing is taking a big hit right now, I mean, the entire travel industry is seeing a big hit, but I would argue Boeing's taking a big hit because a lot of things Boeing has done. It's not clear to me why 3 billion needs to be put in to this bill for that type of thing. That's a tiny drop in the bucket relative to the whole trillion. But if you go through all these, this list, there are many things in there that have just been kind of slammed in there that I would argue aren't really part of a long run objective of stabilizing the economy and, and helping um, our population. Let me, thank you, thank you. It was a great discussion. I, Carrie, I'm gonna turn to you next. Um, although the data indicate, and lots of data from all 50 states, that there was no widespread fraud in the 2020 elections. What we're seeing is that many Republican state legislatures are moving to restrict the franchise from many citizens, particularly citizens of color, under the misnomer of election security. The goal seems to be to make sure that states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia do not turn blue again. How do you view these efforts and do you think they will succeed? Uh, so it's a great question. I've been amused by this uh, the attention on this issue in this election, past election cycle. I go back to 2009, I was teaching an uh, undergraduate state politics course and I had my students to each were assigned a state. I think there were 26, 27 students in the class. I assigned them each a state and the assignment was to go and to see if the legislature in their state had introduced a, a voter ID bill. Again, this is 2009. And if the state had attempted to, if one had been introduced and attempted to pass it, who introduced it, what year? And the students came back and that's why I had an idea what they would find. They came back and found that they had all this now attention to voter ID and election security. And it, you know, this was 2009. And I say, and they looked at the years when these things started to happen. They were quite recent at that time. And the thing that had happened that started this activity was the election of Barack Hussein Obama in 2008. 
And so, so that's this story uh, about election security and IDs and ballot security started way back. Uh, and it's only intensified, intensified uh, over the last decade or so, uh, in part because of the population shifts uh, that we see in the country, the demographic uh, revolution, right? Where uh, Blacks and Latinos becoming a larger part of the electorate in a lot of you know, key important uh, electoral college states. Uh, and part of the response has been, you know, if you can't widen and broaden your electorate, you try to lessen the likelihood of the other group can turn out. Uh, and so we see in, in these states uh, a, a trend uh, and a pattern uh, restricting the right to vote, making it more difficult to vote, to register and vote. Uh, you mentioned 35 states, uh, 33, I think, in the last few days have taken uh, actions to restrict voting. Things like reducing the number of early voting days. Uh, something we've seen in this state, we've been ground zero in North Carolina for some of this, where the appellate court ruled uh, a year or two ago that the Republicans with surgical like precision had gone after uh, black voting rights and trying to restrict the rights of blacks to vote. Uh, and that's a pattern we see in part because of the outcomes in the elections that we've seen since the election of, uh, of uh, Obama. David, any, any comment, Michelle? before we move or Okay, um, let me move and let me just kind of turn to another topic. Uh, and let's turn to issues of foreign affairs. In recent days, the Biden administration seems to be trying to reset foreign policy for the United States. David, let me ask you for your thoughts on what you see as the most, most pressing issues on the foreign policy front for the Biden administration at the moment. You know, Trump was a, a, a real disruptive president. He really uh, had no compunction about kind of, and, and actually kind of reveled in um, both undoing the actions of his immediate predecessors and also kind of confronting the consensus, uh, uh, bipartisan th elements of bipartisan consensus about uh, America's place in the world um, our internationalism. Uh, he was certainly an isolationist. Uh, he had a, a fondness for uh, dictators, whether they be in Turkey or Russia, Egypt, uh, uh, that is, was contrary to, you know, 60, 70 years of American kind of extolling democracy uh, abroad. Uh, and so, you know, uh, he, he also repositioned our kind of consensus against China, uh, uh, China policy. And a lot of people actually uh, you know, applauded the tone, if not the execution uh, of that. So you know, a lot of what is, is going to have to be done is kind of uh, re put together the pieces uh, from what was uh, you know, really disrupted. I think you know, Biden was very much uh, a part of that kind of uh, internationalist uh, establishment, pro-democracy, pro-liberal, uh, and pro-U.S. leadership uh, for the world. And so doing things like coming back into the Paris Accord, uh, coming back into the World Health Organization, unthinkable that you know, American, you, America wants to be part of these international institutions and unthinkable that we would leave it during a global, the most global pan, uh, dangerous pandemic in a in hundred years. Um, I think the question about how to deal with China and how to uh, essentially manage what's an inevitable competition between the United States and China on both military, diplomatic, economic grounds with a lot of very sensitive flashpoints like Taiwan, the South China Sea, always North Korea, and I think it should be mentioned the horrible and, and properly labeled uh, genocide by the Trump administration of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang province are you know, some flashpoints that could really um, be very, very problematic for our, our relationship uh, with China. So thinking through that and, and figure out what our general posture is, let alone individualized policies is a, is a huge uh, I certainly approve of President Biden going to the, I guess it was by video, but saying the Atlantic Alliance is back and, and, and reassuring 
our closest allies, that we were going to be a, a uh, reliable partner for the kinds of things we've been working on together for decades. Uh, it's going to take more than one speech, I think, to, to get, gain, regain their confidence. But uh, of course, that was an important step. And then President Biden has some very important decisions in front of him relating to troop levels in Afghanistan, uh, the longest war in American history, and how we want to uh, uh, work there to both provide security and some sort of stability for the government while trying to get our troops home, which most Americans really want, uh, as well as the big decision about our relationships with Iran and, and the questions relating to rejoining uh, or renegotiating uh, the nuclear accord that uh, Obama negotiated, the Obama-Biden administration negotiated very painstakingly and then uh, Trump left. So that's a very, very big agenda. And that was just for starters. Michelle, let me ask you if you're able to tie the significance of the US domestic economy to US foreign policy. Are the two related? Absolutely. Uh, we are in a global economy. Uh, we cannot be on our own and achieve the same uh, standard of living and you know that that we could uh, uh, if we um, if we if I mean in isolation we cannot achieve the same things that we we can uh, as being part of the global uh, population and you know piggybacking on what David said uh, the issue with China is is very um, is spoken a lot nowadays in terms of national security and, 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 and the like, but uh, very little has been talked about trade policy. Right before um, Trump was elected, I, I went to the Obama White House to help support him on the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership for Trade. And the United States had put a lot of work to join that group um, and Trump immediately pulled us out of that. Uh, and since uh, imposed a lot of trade barriers and uh, that was very clear with China. And despite saying that we were moving to phase two and getting everything better, um, uh, the, the, the amount of tariffs that were imposed on Chinese imports is still like three times what it had been before. Uh, I was hoping that Biden would um, immediately start considering reopening on the trade front um, especially, well, with China and everyone generally. Uh, the problem right now is, especially with telecommunications and issues over Huawei, uh, that now there's, there's concerns over national security in terms of our communication systems. Um, and it's also getting tangled up in kind of industrial policy because the US had had uh, trade uh, policy interventions because we kind of have control or we were kind of dominant in semiconductors that are used in this industry. But then China was dominant in terms of the equipment used in 5G. So we're kind of at different stages, reliant upon each other, but fearful of each other. And um, that is, uh, not an easy thing to solve. I'm not suggesting I have an idea, but uh, certainly I agree with the idea that we need to reopen the economy to the world in every dimension, intellectually, environmentally, trade. One of the big ideas behind trade is that trade prevents wars. Interactions between countries are, are good. It's, it's beneficial to our populations and, and it's, it's very important politically as well. Yeah. Oh, I saw a question flash by. I, I want to. I, I saw. I caught a glimpse of it, and, and the question was something like about Trump's disruption. Is that sort of a normal kind of thing that happens in as you change? Yes, oh. to some to some extent. I think that's that's right. That, that you have some disruption. But the problem I thought I think with the Trump administration was that he broke all the rules. Uh, I mean, you can play good cop, bad cop, but you have to have a cop, right? And he just sort of threw everything out the window, right? Uh, alliances and going alone. Uh, so it's okay to shake it up, but you can't break, you know, throw the game out, take your marbles and go home, right? You have to still work within the bounds. And he's, you can stretch the boundaries, you can stretch the limits, but you have to have some limits. And I think 
you know, now we in a position of having to rebuild those alliances, rebuild trust. We lost the moral high ground in places like China that David mentioned and other places around the world. How could we now go and talk about free and fair elections? Uh, we've had that moral authority that we now lost given what uh, has happened here at home. Paula, can we turn to some questions from alumni that have been submitted? Absolutely. Um, I, I hate to cut this off uh, with your, your questions. Um, just fa absolutely fascinating. Um, the questions come in from a lot of different directions. The first question, um, and, and Paula, you can kind of direct who you want this to go to. The, it wasn't uh, named a particular panelist, but um, thinking about um, the power of the Black Lives Matter movement and the role that Black voters played in electing uh, President Biden, um, how will he or will he be able to deliver progress for Black Americans? Carrie, let me have you start with that and then move to David and Michelle. Yes, it's a very good question, and, and, and the pressure is on. Uh, much like Barack Obama and Biden faced pressure in 2008, being elected, folks were expecting quite a bit. Uh, he's already, to some extent, delivered in terms of some of the appointments that he's made uh, in his cabinet and administration. I think taking up uh, this big bill that Michelle was speaking to has some things in there uh, for some of those constituencies that helped him get elected. Uh, I think part of his plan is to pay back uh, to some extent in this legislation and legislation to come. Uh, so I do think he will try to address that in, in, a, in a policy sense uh, and recognizing that he's not running four years from now. His vice president very well may be and he would to need those supporters to stick around. David. Oh, I think um, I agree with what Kerry said, but I wouldn't see it as strictly in electoral uh, uh, political terms. Uh, I think if anything, the, the pandemic has just laid bare what was very obvious to many, and many at Duke have been studying this, but the gross inequalities uh, that are structural in our society. And, you know, frankly, I think, um, especially during the course of, the, of this particular campaign and, and his experience in the, in the Obama uh, White House, um, you know, I think, I think that became, you know, something that very, very apparent to Biden personally. And I think he feels very comfortable making that a, uh, a centerpiece of his administration. And, you know, whether it uh, be with respect to appointments, whether it be with respect to pushing for uh, civil rights legislation to reverse some horrible Supreme Court uh, cases, uh, prosecuting uh, hate crimes, uh, going after white supremacy systematically uh, in this country, which he has promised uh, to do, um, you know, and, and a variety of other uh, measures. So I would uh, keep my eye on this as, as a real theme for the Biden presidency. Michelle, any thoughts? Otherwise, David, is there another question? Sure. Um, actually, the second question kind of followed up on something uh, David Chancellor just mentioned um, about around prosecutions. Um, the question is that um, in light of the res um, insurrection, there were few, if any, domestic terrorism um, laws to be prosecuted under. Do we see that changing? And if so, is that a good thing? Does it open up opportunities for more things like the Patriot Act, or will it um, in some ways um, address issues of, of racial profiling and other things that have been part of um, the way things have been enforced in the past? Well, that's a, it's a tricky issue and it gets a, a little technical. I'll try to keep it at a, a general level. Uh, let me start with this. When white supremacists have committed crimes, there's been no shortage of federal statutes that they are able to be charged under. <laughs> Usually weapons violations, things relating to explosives, uh, and, and many other charges. We had no trouble bringing federal charges against Dylan Roof, for example, and I believe he's facing the death penalty. Uh, or maybe he negotiated life sentence, I don't remember. So it's not a problem that white supremacists have been getting away with murder. That said, um, there have been many studies that have compared uh, the kinds of sentences that 
For example, Muslims have received for engaging in political violence compared to white supremacists. And it's been shown uh, that white supremacists tend to get, uh, for similar conduct, to get lesser sentences. And it is true that there is no federal law that that's called a domestic terrorism offense uh, that you can be charged with essentially engaging in political, uh, engaging in violence for a political purpose. Uh, if you do that inter with respect to an international ideology uh, and, and your activity crosses, transcends borders, you are called an international terrorist and you can get some very severe charges. And the issue that's been discussed a lot is whether we should have that specific law I have argued that we should, but to the questioner's point, many people are concerned that uh, what is and what is not domestic terrorism could be in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and we have to be very careful that peaceful uh, uh, protest movements that one Justice Department might see less sympathetically than others, let's say like Black Lives Matter, uh, people are worried from a civil liberties perspective, whether an aggressive administration could say, well, I'm gonna use the domestic terrorism laws against uh, a Black Lives Matter organization when a protest, you know, when there's some looting that takes place in connection or after a peaceful protest. So civil libertarians are very worried about that. I do believe a, a law can be crafted that can get at the problem that we're talking about without the um, civil liberties uh, concerns that I just outlined, but that's what the debate is all about. Fantastic. Uh, a um, Maybe a short closing question um, and then we'll let Paula give us a, a, a final word. Um, is governing by executive order the new norm and is it good for the United States? appears to be a, 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 an emerging norm. Uh, and I'll go to, I, Michelle answered the question earlier, I think it's not good for the country if this is the way policy is made. And there's not a, a discussion, a debate, uh, hearings uh, and explorations of, of some of the stuff that we do, right? That Michelle goes and testifies uh, and that's a full debate. Uh, so I hope uh, that we can get our act together again and restore the institutions uh, that we've had over the, the centuries uh, and get back on a normal footing. You think that's possible? I do. I think, you know, I, and you know, I, I think uh, we have the right type of president to make them more likely to happen. Uh, you know, President Biden is a experienced uh, member of Congress, you know, decades on the Hill. Uh, his demeanor uh, the way he approaches politics is one that can lead us in that direction, I think. I think he's going to try. Well, I mean, I kind of, and this is just my personal thought, not an educated thought as an economist, but shouldn't the issue be that we've seen, we've just seen a president who is very willing to take advantage and break the balance of power. And shouldn't Congress at this point be thinking, we want to write legislation to guarantee, so it's great if we're happy with the president and we trust that the, that president's gonna go in the right direction, but we don't know the next president or the next president. So I really feel like the United States needs to go back to reinforcing these balance, you know, the balance of power, um, in our government and, and should see executive orders as, as um, really a, a workaround that presidents have found. And what would be important is not to say, well, it's okay during this presidency and not another, would rather be to say, we need to strengthen our democracy. Well, I'd say the most important thing we could do in that respect would be to um, get rid of the filibuster rule. We've gotten rid of it only for judicial nominations and executive branch nominations, but we are not going to see a wellspring of legislation which would cabin executive authority 
uh, when you have a filibuster threshold, the reconciliation process can really only be used once a year and only for taxing and spending issues like uh, Professor McLean uh, laid out. Uh, so if you want to change the minimum wage, you have to get uh, 60 votes in the Senate. And, and, you know, the filibuster was created in a day where the parties were much less polarized uh, and, and much more aligned and getting 60 votes. And, and it also it was seen as something extraordinary. And uh, if we could pitch one of our colleagues, Bruce Gentleson's son wrote this book recently, uh, my colleague and, the, and colleague of Paula and Carrie in the political science department as well called Kill Switch which basically talks about uh, how this filibuster has just changed the whole orientation of, of, the, of the congressional, of the legislative branch. Um, and it, it, has, it dominates all aspects of the Senate's activity. And guess what? You need two houses uh, to pass legislation. So if you have a Senate that is crippled by the filibuster rule and it's being used I'm not saying Democrats have never used it, but if, if the party that doesn't believe in activist government and wants things to essentially uh, div divulge or uh, default to the private sector, to the market and so on, the not having legislation is much more in line with their priorities than it is with a, a democratic administration and Congress that wants to use government to try to solve problems. Uh, so, I'm all in favor of that. I'm in favor of majority yeah. rule. And I think that would help maybe some of this balance between executive and congressional power. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, in in two dr true Duke fashion, we've got dozens of questions that people would like to dive into. And I'm sure we could stay up all night debating them and listening to um, everyone's insights and opinions on them. Unfortunately, we, we're only scheduled for an hour here tonight. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to thank Dr. McLean for uh, pulling together this incredible panel. Thank each of our panelists. Um, I think we were uh, challenged, inspired, and, uh, and maybe uh, I had driven to go do some reading and some research on our own to, to really think more about some of these questions and topics that you brought up tonight. Um, we look forward to continuing this series on America Today, um, engaging with more Duke faculty, engaging more topics that are in the headlines um, as well as the other aspects of the Forever, Forever Learning Institute um, that will be continuing throughout this spring. I encourage you to look for the Forever Learning Institute um, newsletters and invitations coming to your box and uh, to join us for more incredible conversations uh, showcasing our amazing faculty and the research being done at Duke. And uh, we look forward to the next chance we can come together. And I just wanna close again tonight by thanking each of our panelists for your time but also sharing so generously of, of your expertise with us and helping us tackle some very tough issues. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great evening and continue to be forever Duke. Thank you so much.